studies who is here to deliver the talk the social life of democracy we will be recording today's lecture and it can be accessed by our subscribers on youtube there will be a question and answer session at the end of professor sarukai's talk and all of you are requested to kindly put your questions in the chat box which will then be addressed to professor sundar sarukai this lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department professor simi malhotra i request her to kindly deliver social life of democracy we will be recording today's lecture and it can be accessed by our subscribers on youtube there will be a question and answer session at the end of professor sarukai's talk and all of you are requested to kindly put your questions in the chat box which will then be addressed to professor sundar sarukai this lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department professor simi malhotra i request her to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce professor sundar sarukai thank you so much sanya uh, professor sundar sarukai uh, invited speaker this evening and all others who have joined us i on behalf of the department of english jamia millia islamia extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this distinguished lecture series friends as sanya said this is the 27th lecture of our series and we are indeed lucky to have with us professor sundar sarukai one of the leading voices of our times as our distinguished speaker this evening It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Sarukai, and we are all waiting to hear him speak on the social life of democracy. I am extremely grateful to you, Professor Sarukai, for agreeing to share your time and scholarship with us this morning for you and this evening for us. I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to be a part of our series. I welcome you, and now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Sarukai formally. Uh, though his fan fan following does not really need uh, any formal introduction to his work, uh, Professor Sarukai is the founder of Barefoot Philosophers. He was professor of philosophy at the National Institute of Advanced Study until 2019, and was also the founder director of the Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities, where he set up a number of innovative interdisciplinary programs. He is the author of the following books: Translating the World, Science and Language, published in 2002; Philosophy of Symmetry, 2004; Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, 2005; What is Science, 2012; J. R. D. Tata and the Ethics of Philanthropy, 2020; Philosophy for Children, Thinking, Reading and Writing, 2021; and two books co-authored with Professor Gopal Guru. Uh, the crack mirror an indian debate on experience and theory published in 2012 and experience cast in everyday social published in 2019 his most recent book is the social life of democracy which was published this very year from seagull he is the series editor of rackledge's uh, science and technology studies as well as the co-chief editor of the springer handbook on logical thought in india He has been actively taking philosophy to different communities and places, conducting philosophy workshops for children, bringing philosophy to the public through his writing in the media. We are so honored, Professor Sarukai, that you agreed to be with us this evening uh, and your morning, and we are really looking forward to uh, to hearing you speak. So over to you, Professor Sarukai. Thank you, Professor Malotra. It's a great pleasure and honor to be part of this series. Um, you know, I think Jamia is so much in our uh, thoughts and in our uh, way, in imagination of uh, you know intellectual uh, the force in the country, and I'm very glad to be meet all of you at least virtually. Uh, thank you also for um, this opportunity to share some. parts of my work the new book which you said uh, is called it's titled the social life of democracy um, it is published by seagull and actually the copies are out just this week so uh, it's a coincidentally a good time for me to uh, talk not just about the book but actually to talk a little bit about the motivations for it and you know how i was struggling to understand the question of democracy in the indian context so let me um, begin I, and i hope you can see the the share and if it, at any time it cuts off please let me know because i'll be looking at the powerpoint um so actually the this book came about uh, for a variety of reasons one um it's been a kind of a struggle on trying to make sense of how the public responds to the idea of democracy 
uh, we, have, we know that there have been many different kinds of responses to the question of democracy in India, ranging from extreme cynicism to also uh, recognition of the great work that Indian democracy has been able to do in the country. Uh, but given the perspective of what I've been doing with my colleagues in Barefoot Philosophers uh, is actually to try and engage the public in questions uh, which matter to society and politics. And so part of it began in terms of, uh, you know, with my media writings, which I've been writing uh, columns in different places. And I thought of trying to engage with the question of what constitutes uh, thinking in the public. What, how do we, uh, rather than taking positions and uh, being well aware that today anything you do is an excuse for labeling. It can be labeling of all kinds of categories. That I think it became more important for us to see how does one conduct a rational dialogue, a, a communicative praxis by which we are able to discuss different viewpoints. And that's largely been, I think, something which um, my colleagues in Barefoot Philosophers and I have been trying to do. And part of it also led to our engagement with trying to promote philosophy for children. Uh, perhaps at, at one level, um, you know, trying to make sense of what does philosophy mean for our society and do we need different visions of uh, intellectual activities for our society and so on. And uh, that, of course, led to the book which you mentioned called Philosophy of Children. So as an extension of that and have, having done workshops for children on these things, one of the things which really came up in many of my workshops with children was also the question of democracy. So I think that, uh, you know, it was a theme which was resonating across society at different levels. So I started trying to put together what I'd been writing in the media and to find a way to think about the conceptual space for uh, for a public understanding of democracy. And I must mention, of course, that as I'm sure many of you who work in this field know, the, the, the literature of democracy is very large. And the literature from political philosophy, from philosophy, from sociology, from so many other disciplines, history, um, you know, the, 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 the discipline is very large. And part of my challenge was to be able to um, work with a different framework in trying to talk about democracy in a way which uh, reaches what I think uh, would be the expectations of the public because it is to them that I want to try and establish a dialogue and they are my interlocutors in trying to say uh, trying to understand how they um, could think about the fundamental base of democracy means and in this project I am misguided from very important insights from Ambedkar and uh, through this I'm also trying to see what does it actually mean to think about democracy um, in a from a slightly different context and of course we all know the contribution of Ambedkar to democracy Indian democracy um, very important and a central figure in this but there is a one aspect of Ambedkar which has often not been too much uh, I mean not enough of a discussion of it in um, literature on democracy and to me that was what seemed to be more most important so i began with this larger as i said the mood the kind of a, the kind of um, you know a vision of ambedkar rather than as trying to look at the uh, scholarship of ambedkar directly in this in this book and i began by looking at uh, some of his very important uh, insights into democracy one the democracy um, is really not as much about the government and politics as much as it is about the form of the organization of the society. So obviously any time we want to think about democracy in this kind of a view, we, uh, we are not thinking just about elections and voting somebody leaders, you know, charismatic leaders or not, but actually to think about questions of how is the society organized. And I want to extend that to um, looking at this, asking the larger question, to think of democracy is to ask how can a society be democratic, not how does a party be democratic or whether you have uh, political participation that is democratic, etc. So uh, to extend what Ambedkar is pointing out, of course, is that to say that democracy is not politics, but the philosophy, what in his words, a philosophy of life. And intriguingly, he also points out uh, something else, which again gave me a lot of courage to be able to make the argument that I make in this book, which is that um, uh, in his words, uh, quote, mental disposition of, I mean, democracy is not possible unless the mental disposition of the individuals is democratic. 
So uh, to me, this was very important because the question of democratic action is now located within the individuals, but in terms of dispositions of the individuals, in terms of behaviors, in terms of actions, in terms of thoughts of the individuals. So uh, it really, uh, I think it strikes at the real heart of the way in which we can imagine democracy. That is, that uh, we know there's no point in really talking about democratic government, and we have been we know the pitfalls and the kinds of questions that have uh, you know that have been part of uh, Indian democracies or any other or American democracies, for example. But the question is, what does it actually imply for each one of us to be part of a democratic system? Not well, what does it mean for us to vote, but what does it mean for us to say that we are part of a democratic society, part of a democratic um, you know culture, government, etc. So, um, and I think this is something which um, will speak to many of us, which would be to say, if not all of us, that you there is no possibility of imagining a democratic government unless a society for which, in Ambedkar's words, unless a society for which it functions is democratic in its form and structure. So that is the basis by which I started thinking of, uh, you know, putting together all this stuff I've been doing in our public uh, engagement and in my public writing and try and get a framework to see uh, why should Ambedkar's ideas matter so much to us today um, from, you know, slightly uh, different context as I'll show you now. Uh, for Ambedkar, it's very clear that uh, the, 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 the ideas of democracy are inspired by the three values of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. But um, if you look at what he writes about these terms, there is something, uh, again, I, I'm just saying this at a very brief uh, comments here. Uh, I, I do discuss this extensively in the book, so I'm sure you'll be able to get a better idea of it. But I want to highlight some of the seminal uh, points about how, what kind of ways we could approach the thinking of democracy. So uh, to quote Ambedkar again, um, if in democracy, liberty does not destroy equality and equality does not destroy liberty, it's because at the basis of both there is fraternity. Fraternity is therefore the root of democracy. And fraternity is what, of course, Ambedkar calls Maitri. And uh, this is uh, such an important idea um, of trying to understand how we could conceptualize democracy today without sacrificing questions of liberty and equality, which are, of course, extremely important. But I think what we need to recognize is uh, uh, Ambedkar's very important insight that just talking in terms of liberty and equality is not enough. In fact, they are in some sense in tension with each other. They are contrary to each other. Because if I want liberty, if liberty is defined in terms of individual liberty, allowing me to do what I can do, then to say that there should be equality, that everybody should have some notion of equality uh, present in, let's say, social action, uh, that seems to become uh, that seems to become a big problem. There's a, that contradiction you can see in our uh, debates on uh, reservation and so on. So uh, the point is to reduce the values of democracy only into liberty, primarily into liberty as many democracies have done today, or to some notions of liberty and equality as some other examples of democracy have done, is not enough unless you have a meaningful understanding of what fraternity is. And uh, not only is fraternity one of the three values of liberty and fraternity uh, 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 for democracy, it is the foundational one. Because without it, you cannot even imagine a meaningful function of liberty and equality where they do not cancel each other. And this idea uh, is, I think, something very important. And it's something which we need to uh, understand how to operationalize. And what does it actually mean then to say this? And how do we um, you know, build upon this? And that was really, uh, in a sense, uh, my challenge, if you like, in trying to, because I, I'm totally committed to this view. And I, I believe that this is the way in which one can think of a meaningful, non-hierarchical um, society. But how, why is it that when Ambedkar was so clear about this and repeatedly wrote about it, that it has not transformed into social transformations as we would like it to have done? What exactly is the problem in producing mental dispositions of people to be democratic? Uh, why is it that political parties themselves do not have mental dispositions to be democratic? Even to have simple uh, elections within parties has always been such a big problem.
and therefore to me the point is not just to look at it in terms of uh, political thought and political action and political representation but uh, ask larger questions of you know what does it actually mean to cultivate fraternity in society through this framework of democracy i mean of course questions of friendship and fraternity can be thought about in different ways uh, within societies through various kinds of forums to do it but i'm i was trying i'm trying to look at it in terms of the specific idea of democracy so um in trying to analyze it this way i make a point which can of course be uh, contentious but i hope it is also uh, you know raises enough questions for me for us to think about which is that um the claim that i want to make consistently through the book is that the only way democracy can function in this ambedkarite vision is if it becomes part of our daily lives and you know um what does it actually mean to say we be be democratic in our daily lives what does it mean to say democracy should always be understood in the context of its social life what does it mean to remove this kind of democratic action from a particular political action of let's say voting or representation of politics into uh, something which becomes part of everything that i do in our, uh, that everything we do in our daily lives and it is it is um, this argument that i try and make um, in this uh, in, in this book um so you know one of the, of course i must say one of the um, incentives to do the book in this manner was of course professor romila tapas book on dissent which is also published by siegel um, you know in this kind of a series and i was very struck by how uh, this kind of an approach can reach out to large number of people to initiate critical discussions it's not about agreement or disagreements but it's about how we can open up the space for thinking about this and in doing that i did confront a basic challenge uh, which is to say um, you know the democracy is something which i which i propose is something which has to be brought into our everyday lives it has to be thought through in particular ways it has to become a part of mental dispositions but um, so much of stuff written in, on democracy particularly under the rubric of what we call academic writing has also alienated so many people in trying to engage with these questions of democracy so at one point you have the scholarship of democracy produced by various disciplinary uh, pressures uh, on all of us in from working from different disciplines uh, but on the other hand there is also a need to be able to bring the question of democracy in a more democratic manner i think um, you know this particular concept demands something like that but um, so I, it was a struggle for me to try and see how do i try and balance this because there are i mean obviously scholarship on democracy has produced very important ideas and our own disciplinary practices do give us deeper ways of trying to understand the concept so the balance was tried to find a, a balance between um not, not making it academic in the standard sense but also uh, making it sufficiently complex and deep so that it opens up different perspectives for them rather than making statements and claiming this is what it is that's what uh, ambedkar said this is what we should do etc so it's more this dialogic process which is the basic aim and i'm i'm just giving you the contents here not because i'm going to talk about it but just to show you the larger framework by which i thought the concept of democracy could be th uh, thought about um and in particular by when i try to look at some simple examples of concept of democracy keeping in mind that i'm trying to engage people with the possibilities of different kinds of democracies because you know one of the things i must say which triggered a lot of my thought is i'm sure this happened to many of you you know um we when i talk when i talk to some people i mean many people we routinely hear things like you know the army should be running india they would have done a better job of running the country i have had people say in various conversations oh the british should have stayed on maybe you know they would have run the country better or of course um, there was a period of time and i have heard that the chinese should take over india because they can run the country better and so on so to me the challenge was to be able to say so what is it about democracy um, that you know you that that is that should become important to you when we make comments like this and uh, you know these are not just passing comments there are people you know these kinds of ideas distill and sediment in people and it grows in different ways so um, so when i was looking at uh, some examples of uh, models of democracy and i'll very briefly touch upon 
uh, the Indian and the Chinese model very quickly. And then I was trying to uh, make the argument that the everyday, the social life of democracy has to be found in our everyday actions, in our domains of democracy, which begins with questions of labor, which begins with our house, our institutions, and the formation of what I call as a democratic self. And there again, I go back to Ambedkar and to some extent Gandhi to make sense of how you can conceive of the democratic self. But again, um, more importantly, to I want to go back to looking at what people see as processes of for democracy, which is very simple processes of voting, and try and show how the questions of ethical processes in democracy really occur through these questions of um, you know uh, ideas of voting and so on. So I'm going to just say a little bit till the um, the question ethical process of democracy to give you a general uh, gist of the argument, and I will not be talking about my last two sections of the book, which are uh, you know which I think are a little more heavier in some sense, which is about the nature of truth and what does uh, what is the theory of truth in democracy? What is the theory of truth in politics? And then finally, the very contentious question of democracy and freedom. Okay, so um, again, this is just as I said to give you the very basic out, uh, you know, the way in which I tried to conceptualize this particular argument, and I'm going to speak about one part of it so that uh, you know we have some idea of what I'm trying to uh, talk about. So let me begin with certain. You know, I first begin by talking about sort of the concept of democracy itself. How can one conceptualize this concept? What does it mean? Uh, what are the different kinds of other concepts which are necessary to talk of democracy and so on, which might include things like equality, liberty, fraternity, and stuff like that. But the problem in talking about democracy is also the fact that there are many types of democracies. And this proliferation of the idea of democracy is something we really need to think about. Because, um, you know, democracy is something which seems to have become a concept which has been appropriated by many, many uh, segments of the society. So there are uh, terms like people's democracy, direct democracy, presidential, I mean, parliamentary, presidential, etc., particular kinds of political represent particular points of political processes but ideologically you could have people's democracy liberal democracy participatory democracy and so on so what exactly is the word democracy doing in all of them what is the kind of common meaning that it may have in all these kinds of different democracies now add to, the, to add to the confusion we also have the claim about cultures of democracy the repeated claims about the unique character of Asian democracies and African democracies, Chinese democracy, Indian democracies. Um, you know, in a sense, I think we should recognize that the naming of these kinds of democracies uh, in terms of Asian, African, Chinese, Indian, etc., are also a response to a kind of a hegemony of, uh, uh, of particular intellectual tradition, which seems to define democracy entirely from a particular perspective, let's say um, the European, Anglo, Western perspective. So it is not a surprise that that kind of a response comes from many of these societies which want to declare themselves as being democratic because democracy has, become, has got a certain kind of a global cultural value. Um, you know, it's very highly privileged uh, in the international arena. So it, it does make sense for people to be able to declare themselves a democracy in by pointing to particular uh, sections of what does it mean to be democratic. And um, a very important challenge in all of these formulations, whether it's these uh, different cultures of democracy or the different types of democracy, is the invocation of the people, most famously voiced by uh, by the people of the people for the people, uh, for, you know, from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. But uh, it's something which you know I'm sure all school children read. But everywhere around it, right from the preamble to the Indian Constitution to everybody who's talking about uh, democracy or invokes a question of democracy, the people becomes the most important construct. And I think the first thing we need to recognize is the, to really look at the uh, critical analysis of what the people means. And I think um, you know Ambedkar's point about fraternity must directly be interpreted in terms of a criticism of this notion of the, the kind of a myth of the people that is produced and offers um, you know, one can argue that Ambedkar's vision offers a different conceptualization of what we mean by the people. 
And uh, finally, uh, I mean, the challenge in this, but uh, when talking about democracy, is when we say that you know you have political parties which are internally not democratic but stand for democracy, for example, we are actually saying something else about the nature of democracy that we want democracy to be present in all our actions. But what does it actually mean? How does you, how do you even conceptualize that? And I think that is a core challenge which we try and uh, which I try and deal with in this book. Now, let me give a set of particular. Um, idea just to show the multiplicity of the ideas of democracy uh, i look at two very briefly at two um, two segments one on indian democracy and one on chinese democracy uh, to show you how the uh, the kind of challenges uniqueness and also um, the kind of multiple uh, possibilities that are present in imagining democracy in these uh, in these uh, forms uh, there's much on Indian democracy, and I'm sure all of us is uh, having experienced it. We can uh, have our own views on this, but I'm and, and I have written a little bit about it in this book. But I, here I want to point out to just two or three important points about Indian democracy in order to construct my larger argument here. I begin with uh, the comment by Professor Suri um, in in the volume in which they have done about Indian democracy, uh, uh, where he points out, and this is the part of the larger uh, anti-democratic impulse present in democratic scholarship in the, around the world, uh, where he points out that well, the uh, the global debates and theorization on democracy go on as if India's democracy does not matter, even though it's India's most pop uh, world's most populous democracy, etc. In the standard textbooks and reference books on theories of democracy, India and Indian figures, figures uh, thinkers hardly figure. And um, again, this is a point in, in which is setting up a larger context of what are the uniqueness, uh, different parts or unique points of Indian democracy, and how we should be able to take them seriously in terms of a kind of a theoretical conceptual reflection. Um, in the same volume, um, Chandok and Kumar in another excellent review of uh, Indian democracy point out that while Indian democracy may have various different um, characteristics, um, um, in, in their words, uh, they point out to quote, one outstanding achievement of Indian democracy has been the institutionalization of political equality. Um, here, so there's a lot of, um, you know, clarification we need for this. One, there is some notion of political equality which is present, but political equality by itself cannot be seen isolated from other kinds of equality. And that's a point which Chandok and Kumar also make explicitly, which I'll come to in a second. Um, when you look at, if I want to summarize, and again, I'm, I know I'm doing it very briefly, but as I said, I want to move on to other aspects of this. So uh, to, if you want to look at certain kinds of dominant success, and if I want to really quickly highlight some kind of successes about democracy, um, I'm not going to talk about the number of political parties, which is really amazing. The kind, of, especially when you see, for example, the U.S. elections, which just got over with uh, two-party, um, you know, with a two-party system. The kind of the the richness of democratic processes in India, the multiple parties which are present, are actually, I know, many times people might tend to say, "Oh, those are the weaknesses of democracy." Um, I'm sure that many of us realize that they are one of the great strengths of democracy uh, in terms of this political action. But other than all these kinds of processes of voting and the, I think the great job which election commission does in India, but other than those kinds of institutional structures which are extremely important, I'm not negating them, um, we want to look at really the major impact of what Indian democracy has done. And if there is one major impact which Indian democracy is uh, can be proud of, it is the fact that the process of democracy's impact on social structure, particularly the uh, loosening of the rigid caste structure. And that's something which um, definitely must be seen as, I would rate it as one of the most important contributions, not just of Indian democracy, but of democracies across the world in terms of their capacity to be able to engage and intervene within particular, uh, within very well established hierarchical structures within society. Um, as the, many of the scholars writing on Indian democracy point out, it has provided a sense of agency to the poor um, and the economic and social non-elite. And this is the standard um, argument which has come about that, in fact, the elites uh, very rarely participate in democracy, but uh, you know the percentage of them voting in democracy is also quite uh, uh, less compared to the voting uh, numbers of the poor. So the it has, uh, you know, it's something with uh, Javed Alam has also written about. This is about, I mean, this argument that 
the 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 success of indian democracy has actually given a kind of visibility to the poor and to these kinds of mar marginalized uh, communities within the caste structure is something we need to take into account more seriously although we recognize that it may not have had the ideal form that we would want but at least these have been very important steps in which uh, what indian democracy has been able to do and um, in terms of politics again is something which we uh, engage with every day in our lives is that the most visible aspect of politics is defined through identity um, uh, formation um, and the identity formation is based on uh, to say it's based on caste and religion rather than community interests alone is actually um, you know opens up a different idea of understanding pan indian understanding of what democracy has uh, done through the different regions of the country uh, one of the implications of that is that the idea of democracy in india as chandokan kumar also pointed out is that the, uh, the there's an important shift from the right of individuals to rights of groups so many times when we talk about democracy particularly when even young kids come and tell me that you know they have there is some notion of freedom which is available to everybody you know and i think children should have the freedom just like adults do but the belief that everybody has a particular notion of freedom that they have a right to do certain kinds of things whether it's um, you know right not to attend classes or right not to Uh, submit assignments as one of my students once said uh, so th the question of right of individuals uh, which has become such an important uh, of, uh, you know trope for modern democracies particularly western democracies as against rights of groups not of just individuals this is a extremely interesting um, conceptual idea i mean we know that this has happened through these various kinds of identity formation but what exactly does it imply how do we think about this question of uh, conceptualizing the notion of right to a community right to a group as against right to an individual and given that the right to the individual has had so much of privilege how does one engage with the criticisms of rights to groups and that i think um, in fact this shift is really one of the most dominant success of indian democracy and uh, finally um therefore what the argument is that indian democracy should first be seen as a process towards social justice um, you know rather than just as a rather than just merely as a process of individual liberty or individual rights it should actually be seen as a process of social justice or towards some notion of social justice and once we understand that then we we i uh, think recognize that what we need to do with strengthening the democracy is to strengthen these questions of social justice and uh, really it, i i do think it offers a fantastic model for many other kinds of um, Uh, you know democratic movements in other parts of the world so what suri said in the beginning um, you know where i quoted in the beginning about the fact that there is um, the theorization seems to ignore indian thinkers and indian experience um, again is a you know is a reminder that this kind of um, ways of thinking are an important not just in indian context but for other societies but having said all this there are these fundamental questions which again come back repeatedly in public discourse when people talk about you know people somebody might say well um, i do agree that rights of groups are important at one level but to what extent what does a right of a group entail etc so there are uh, challenges in trying to conceptualize um, the notion of individual freedom and rights in hierarchy so most of my uh, engagement with the public particularly um, you know uh, particularly with the the middle class and the upper classes or the elite students comparatively within even you know even though they may be in ordinary schools uh, would be this idea that they have this notion of individual freedom which has been so much driven into them particularly by a consumerist economy and therefore you know, you know how does one really try and convince them that the notions of freedom in a hierarchical society in a society which has got very different social structures has to be rethought and uh, conceptualized slightly differently so <laughs> one way of putting that is to ask what can the contours of democracy be in a society in which the individual is de a deeply social being the kind of socialities that characterizes our everyday ness or everyday being ness or everyday actions is something which is deeply social in so many ways ranging from family to community to caste to religion to gender so i mean how does what does it how do we then go back to this questions of this everybody 
uh, producing this notions of um, uh, freedom for an individual. Um, this is really an interesting question. I mean, and that's a question which I deal with in the last section of the book, which I won't be able to talk about here because it's quite a lot of stuff there. Uh, but I'm just uh, mentioning this because one of the biggest problems in democracy in terms of its actions, both politically and socially, is that uh, the individual who seems to be the, um, you know, who seems to, whose liberty seems to be the goal of democracy, um, if you really look at it carefully, the individual is instrumentalized in all these, I think in all societies, in all democratic societies, but particularly more so in societies where there's a constant intermingling of the individual and social. So one of the ways in which we see the reflection of this is the invocation of the ideas of vote bank or people voting as communities rather than as individuals and that or, or people voting, you know, I know like, uh, groups where um, you, there is a politician who pays money to the somebody who is called the leader of that group, um, you know, many of these which comes from the labor class and those people who live in that uh, place will be paid by the leader and they will vote in mass to that particular person. So there's a very interesting economics and politics of how this voting process itself happens, including through transaction of uh, goods and money, etc. But the point is the voting uh, he is um, not restricted to the individual. There, is, there seems to be an intermingling of uh, groups and communities uh, who vote together at, um, at, at every step of this process. And also, one of the most important problems with all this, uh, finally, which I pose a challenge, is that even if we think we have individual votes and have built a democratic society, the access to democratic institutions is very unequal. So people cannot access even simple things like a court and even simple things like a police station to um, to put a you know FIR or whatever. So given all this, uh, what how exactly do we reconceptualize that? Uh, one of the starting points, of course, we could uh, draw upon is again Chandok's and uh, Kumar's point to quote them, democracy can only be realized and political equality helps us realize social and economic equality. And thereby it explicitly opens up the social and economic within the word political or within the con concept political. And this is something uh, which is uh, very important for us to think about. But what is this vision? What is the vision of democracy that can help us do this? How do you actually think through this? Uh, and I'm not saying that nobody hasn't, uh, they haven't thought through it. I think Indian democracy is actually a great example of how this kind of a balance would in political, social, and economic equality is, uh, is being attempted at every step, however imperfectly and however um, badly at some points. But I think uh, that this has been a very important process of what Indian democracy has been. Uh, but among the very important criticisms about this is one uh, by Gopal Guru on a very important piece on liberal democracies and Dalits, where he points out that the promise of liberal democracy in India has not really been very fruitful for the uh, Dalits. So in his words, he quotes, a Dalit audit of liberal democracy over the past 60 years suggests that liberal democracy has preferred a skewed response to the Dalit question. And a very important point he makes from that is that there has been an invisibilization of the Dalits. A very large segment of Dalits have been uh, completely made invisible in this particular democratic process. So even in these kinds of questions about um, the successes of Indian democracy, these are some of the challenges which have uh, come about. And I think, again, going back to Ambedkar's vision is one way of trying to address some of these questions and trying to see how we could uh, actually formalize it in some sense. Um, there's a lot on Chinese democracy, and I'm, not, I'm just going to say something very briefly just to point out the fact that thinking about the concepts of democracy raise very different ideas of democracy. And I'm going to just very briefly mention this here. Uh, it's, uh, you can read the whole document uh, put out by their um, press wing. It's called in December 2021. It's a document called China Democracy That Works. It's a very interesting argument because a uh, document because it begins by asserting that India, uh, China is the world's largest democracy. Essentially saying India often declares itself of course, other countries also call India as the world's largest democracy, but in their views, China is the world's largest democracy. And, they, and the whole document is a um, is a very well argued uh, 
um, argument for making this claim that China is the world's largest democracy. They call themselves a people's democracy and a democracy that works. Um, as I said, there are a lot of very interesting uh, aspects of that um, document. And I, you know, if those of you are interested, I'm sure would love to go and read that. Uh, but I just want to highlight just one or two points because I want to keep this very brief because I want to move to the question of, uh, you know, practices of democracy. So. Um, and what they're actually doing is they take all the arguments for what democratic action is, such as voting, etc., and then say, well, that may be true, but actually democracy means something more. So what they begin by is saying, again, here you can see the role of the people, the concept of the people which underlies many of this. So they'll say whether a country is democratic depends upon whether its people are truly the masters of the country. So the people are the most important conceptual component in the idea of democracy here. So to them, what does it actually mean? It to be a masters of the country means not just to go and vote and not just claim that so many people have voted, therefore they were the world's largest democracy, but more than that, it's about participation in uh, governance, participation in decision-making within societies. Uh, as they point out in the document, uh, the world's largest democracy is not just not about giving promises during elections, but whether the promises were fulfilled after election. So they are shifting the way in which you evaluate the parameters of democracy, not numbers of voting, but numbers of participation, not whether you know everybody comes and says, we are going to do this, we are going to do that, but a means of evaluation of whether those promises were fulfilled, um, not laws, alumni enforcement, etc. So they have a variety of uh, you know arguments about this. And they also make a, a, a important point. Again, this is a polemical, political point, of course, reacting to the rest of the world, which says China is not a democratic country, by saying um, whether a country is democratic should be just judged by its people, not dictated by a handful. And here, you know, uh, why I'm saying this is they also go back in uh, making the argument that there are cultural ideas of democracy that one should take into account, and that it is not a monolithic, one kind of a model which fits all. And, and much of this is actually a critique of what they see as um, the foundations of Western democracy. So they argue that um, you know Asian democracies or any democracy of any country should be is something which is rooted in its own history, culture, and tradition, and therefore uh, it's it's le it's legitimate to call China uh, democracy as uh, Chinese democracy. Going further, they make uh, a very important uh, point, and I think a very contentious point, and I'm sure uh, may raise many of your eyebrows. Um, it is the argument that democracy and dictatorship are symbiotic elements. And first of all, they set the argument of what democracy is in the critique of the regular parameters of violating democracy. Then they point out that it is about there are cultural elements to democracy. And then they make the argument that democracy and dictatorship are symbiotic elements. So as, uh, as um, you know, they write in the document, quote, democracy, uh, democracy and dictatorship appear to be a contradiction in terms. But together, they ensure the people's status as masters of the country. A tiny minority is sanctions in the interest of the great majority, and dictatorship serves democracy. It's a very brave acknowledgement of a point which has often been a point of contention about um, calling countries democratic, including, for example, uh, North Korea, um, earlier countries in Eastern Europe, and of course now China. Again. Um, if you think that democracy and dictatorship, obviously it seems to be a very important contradiction in the way we have conceptualized it. But again, look at their argument. The point is that even though they appear to be a contradiction, as long as they ensure people of the society as masters of the country, then that is the true meaning of democracy. So they're actually shifting the goalposts of what you mean by democracy. And they also point out that if you really want to look at the, your own parameters, they have the high among the highest voting percentage in the world. They claim it's close to 90%. Uh, there is some notion of choice. It is not that everybody is uh, cannot choose individuals. Uh, they, there are different parties, all of which may come under the Communist Party, of course. But still, uh, people can vote for somebody within that uh, particular segment. And there is a, a very um, great involvement of people at the ground level in uh, their participation in governance. Um, so this is, I'm just saying this is a document just to tell you that 
uh, you know, how do we respond to many of these views on democracy? How do we understand these different kinds of conceptual terms in democracy? But in all of them, as we see, we come to this mythic thing called the people. Okay, and how the idea of the people has itself been uh, appropriated and used for various purposes um, by societies and others. So once I set out these different ideas of democracy and I want to look at the ideas of the, what could be the ideas of people, etc., I go back to Ambedkar's vision to ask the question, okay, I'm willing to accept there are, there are these kinds of possibilities of democracy and how different societies have been able to do certain kinds of uh, particular responses in the context of social organization, in the context of people, whatever that means. But um, to Rajar ask then therefore the question, how does it become a social form of life? How does it become part of mental dispositions? And to me, one of the ways by which it seems obvious to do, and one of the ways in which we have to reconceptualize a democracy, is to really ask a question about the production of a democratic society. And the production of a democratic society necessarily entails production of democracy at every stage of our lives. Which means that to understand uh, a society as being democratic, we need to conceptualize what it means to be democratic at home, to be democratic at school, at, in universities, in offices, in institutions, and then politics. After all, our politicians are produced from the social order. And therefore, all that they learn about being undemocratic in these stages of home, school, etc., are what gets uh, operationalized in governance and politics. So what exactly does it actually mean? To be able to talk about um, home, school, etc. Now, there are, you know, it, this is a very difficult question because what, what does it actually mean to be democratic in a house? What does it have mean to be democratic? Uh, is it to be democratic if a child in a family says that, you know, I will take a decision on which school I'll go to or what I should study or what I should do, etc., etc. So, these ideas that there is some notion of, um, you know, inability of people to be able to take a decision often influences how democracy, the, the practices of democracy at home, transfers with practice of democracy at government. For example, uh, if we believe that as adults, we know better than the children and therefore we need to guide our children, very similar arguments are given by the nation or the government and the, uh, in the name of the nation to tell that, uh, to make the argument that people are like children and they don't have to be told everything that uh, the parents know they don't they don't have the competence to make decisions on everything that the parents can do for example in the case of the nation it goes into secrets and official secrets and anti-national etc in terms of parents it may be that you don't know what uh, what is the world like uh, we will tell you how we should be etc so the the idea i mean especially in india the question of family is a, such an important um, you know a social force it's something which uh, gopal guru and i have discussed much in our uh, book the everyday social the caste and the everyday social um, you know and we see the 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 inability of conceptualizing democracy within families being reflected in some of the difficulties in conceptualizing democracy uh, at the level uh, at the national level so one way in which I was trying to engage with um, Ambedkar's point to take him seriously enough to think through his possibilities and how do you make create mental discussions of democracy is to think about uh, the production of what I call a democratic self. And, you know, there are um, different reasons for uh, making this argument. Um, but the first step in doing this idea of understanding what a democratic self is, is to recognize that uh, there is that we are all even individual selves are actually part of a social self. A social self becomes a foundational construct from which individual selves can be removed. And this recognition that the, the every concept of the social of the of the individual is in some sense indebted to the social is I think an extremely important question for us to think about. Again, a point which we have discussed quite a bit in our earlier book on the everyday social. But, um, you know, we can see this production of the social self in different ways. And in this uh, book, I uh, try and use um, Ambedkar's um, a very important idea of self-respect. Um, and I'm sure many of you know uh, D.R. Nagaraj's seminal work, 
uh, comparing uh, Gandhi's ideas of uh, Swaraj, uh, self-respect, uh, self-governance, and self-respect. But definitely, uh, we have the conceptual capacities within within these kind of Indian political thinkers and philosophers like Ambedkar to be able to conceptualize a particular idea of how is it that each one of us develop the notions of a democratic self through recognition of concepts such as self-respect. Okay, and that's one kind of a discussion which I do in the book in order to make this argument. So what I'm trying to point out here is that while it may seem very difficult to conceptualize how it's very difficult to be democratic, Actually, if you think about it, it is could be tiring to be democratic at every step of the way. If we think of democracy in a particular manner, which is if we think of democracy as, um, you know, certain kinds of individual rights and so on. But if you start building your democratic self based on these other ideas of understanding what is it to be democratic, including the questions of self-respect and self-governance, um, we will actually come to a natural um, conclusion, at least that's a natural the conclusion I come to in their argument is that uh, one of the most important constituents, conceptual elements which support any idea of democracy is the question of labor. And again, um, to me, it's a very fascinating question of how labor, which should be the most central component of democracy in conceptualizing what democracy is, is often not understood enough in that context. Um, one of the arguments I make in the book is, of course, that labor is a concrete way uh, by which this idea of what the people, you know, this abstract notion which everybody uses, every political uh, system uses the idea of the people, this abstract notion become, actually becomes actualized in, uh, in any society. And the question of labor is very deep. It enters into questions of, uh, in my discussion here, it enters the question of science and democracy, it enters into the question of religion and democracy, and so on. And uh, part of the reason why, uh, the, for me, the labor is the central core uh, conceptual domain of democracy comes from the fact that even if we uh, stick with certain accepted ideas of democracy, such as, such as equality and freedom, they cannot be dissociated from the idea of labor at all. In the last part of the book, actually, um, I point out how it's impossible to conceptualize notions of freedom itself without um, you know, highlighting its specific and problematical relation with labor. And therefore, one could therefore call, um, you know, I want, I could, one could interpret the different cultures of democracy, which people talk about, like in Chinese, Indian, Asian, African, Western, etc., as actually cultures of labor. And there is a, a very deep uh, connection to that. So in the remaining few minutes, I want to just point out one way of thinking through a particular process of democracy. That is, I've been trying to set out a larger argument about how we could look at these kinds of concepts of democracy. I want to try and see if, um, to show you one particular, um, you know, kind of a way of responding to this, uh, to pointing out maybe the ethical uh, processes of democracy, what I call as ethical process of democracy. I want to look at ways in which we can understand questions of voting. Again, as I said, I, re I remember that I'm trying to do this as a public discourse on uh, when people come and tell me, oh, you know, people get uh, money for voting. What is this? Is this really democratic or not, etc. I, I really wanted to have a kind of a, a framework by which I can discuss, uh, for example, uh, with them about what the nature of voting is. So I begin with a very simple um, point, which is the argument that there's uh, one person, one vote is actually what is really the significance of one person, one vote? It is very important. We should remember, of course, in the Constitutional Assembly, this was such a widely debated, uh, hotly debated topic where everybody should have one person should be able to everybody should have a vote. Um, you know, for people even today tell me that it's only people who are educated should vote, whatever that means and so on. But I think the idea that we can talk about one person, one vote without recognizing that there is no other one person, one X in the society. So, uh, 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 the society does not have a principle of one person, one something for anything else. There is no one person, one house. There's no one person, one scooter or one car or whatever else it is. One person, one TV. The point is when nothing about the social order is really based on this one person, one thing, the equal value, the so-called equal value, then what is so significant about one person, one vote? It is just that the one person, one vote, one person comes, a poor person who is totally marginalized, will come and put uh, her vote and then go back into a society in which there is that person is not a value as an individual. No, the value of that one is totally lost. 
what is this point about what is this glorification of this one person one vote idea while saying that i know it's a very important principle because without it we are we will probably be in a much worse situation but i'm trying to use that principle as a stepping stone to conceptualize other kinds of ideas of democracy now the biggest problem when we start conceptualizing what is the ethical ideas of democracy and not just look at democracy as a voting practice or a particular kind of a political process then uh, much of the arguments about the ethical process of democracy go back to the ideas of majority and greatest good argument you saw that in the china document that they even quote in their own words the sanction of the minority is okay if the if, the, if it's for the greatest good so um the greatest good argument of course uh, very popular in ethics is a, is also a very problematical argument because it does privilege a particular group called the great, uh, you know for whom it is the greatest good so uh, you can look at then ask a question by asking forget about democracy as a principle of political action what is the or how do i conceptualize the ethical principles behind democracy the standard response to that would be that the most important ethical process of democracy are due freedom dissent uh, choice etc but i would argue that as far as we can see empirically about democracies around the world these ideas are just exclusive to some who can claim freedom who can demand freedom who can operationalize freedom the idea that freedom and dissent is present everybody in a democratic society is false it's not empirically true it's not available to a very large number of the population in the in in every society in every democracy and the in other words the so called people the people has never been uh, never got the so called fruits of democracy which one vocal community or a group within a democratic society might demand for so what um what exactly is the idea of democracy doing here to me i would argue that the the real ethical processes of democracy is that it challenges the uh, conceptualization of the people as only a collection as only citizens as only certain kind of people who can vote etc and how then can it have an ethical process if it is to think of a collection a way uh, uh, you know just as a number of people then i think we have lost it there is nothing democratic about that processes and one of the arguments i make and i'm sure that maybe people who may have disputed but at least in my attempt to formulate it this is the argument that i feel uh, most comfortable in understanding how an ethical basis of democracy can come and that is the argument that any action any democratic action in a society can only be defined as one which is always from the perspective of the worst of in a majority rather than the elite or uh, rather than the elite or not rather the elite the middle classes etc that is that while a democracy as freedom seems to suggest that i have a right to vote for my interests you know like choosing the society the party i want choosing a particular party which supports the policies i want etc that is not that's there is no ethical dimension in a democracy that it, yeah it can be a political process maybe it's a functional process maybe it's a process which is um, best for the people who are the elite in a society but if democracy is special from other systems because it has an ethical core then that ethical core is not about this individual freedom to vote for things which are convenient for me or preferable for me but it is only um uh, so the the way i phrase it is the only meaningful evaluation of democracy has to be res with respect to governance for the well being of the worst off in a society in other words i vote not for myself but in voting on behalf of acting on behalf of the worst off the marginalized the voiceless and the powerless in a society it's only through this definition that it becomes that democracy itself becomes part of li daily life and becomes part of social order so even in the act of voting i'm not reducing democracy to voting but as i said this is the biggest question i often have when we talk about democracy how do we understand voting what is this uh, act of voting that I think somehow he's got logged off. Maybe you can just alert, uh, alert him. Yeah.
Right. I think you've got logged off, Professor Sarukai, so we can resume. Back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think um, I think this the um, Google Meet also had enough of what I had to say. Um, I was anyway concluding there, so um, I think I've yeah. So um, please take your time. I think I'll conclude with that, and um, uh, yeah. So maybe there are some questions I can talk a little bit more about the other aspects of of the ethical processes that I talk about, uh, including the question of um, public space and the notion of uh, what is democratically public space and, you know, the particular ways of rethinking about that. So, uh, yeah, and then to really conclude our argument, one would have to relook at questions of, um, you know, notions of really rethink at questions of notions of freedom and its relationship to um, various other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, social constructs that we have about it. So, in in I mean, in general, what I've tried to do is to map out a terrain of thinking about certain concepts, which will hopefully enable us to understand what does it mean to think through this Ambedkarite vision of democracy, which forces a, a kind of a, a moral imperative on each one of us to be democratic in some sense some sense rather than just talking about you know these people uh, in terms of communities and groups and uh, what does it actually entail and whether it is possible i believe it's very possible so I, because i'm a perennial optimist um, in spite of everything that i see around me but it is a difficult process and to me as i said in this more than just as a set of uh, self-help book i'm more interested in saying how can we think through it so how can i debate about somebody whom i cannot agree with and they have such terrible views of democracy or what uh, society should be but for me it's easy to call them this or that but i think as a social form how do i engage with them how do i how am i able to convince them about something so i would see this book as part of that attempt to build this public um, dialogue uh, where I'm sure we'll all agree and disagree with each other on different points, but how are we going to do it in a meaningful manner so that we build a society that is based on Ambedkarite idea of Maitri of fraternity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Saruki. I mean, it was such a treat to us. We all were so looking forward to this evening. We really, you know, some of us have really read you and we were so eager. And, and you know, really, that was a very vast, yet very intensive and thorough lecture. And I'm sure this is just a warm up uh, for us. Um, and we look forward to reading your book. Uh, so we will move into the question answer to move to the sure. question answer section if you will allow Professor Saru. Yeah, we sure. have a whole yeah. host of questions and I have you know been shifting between platforms and picking up questions from here and there. So if you will allow, I will club a sure. couple of questions and post it to you. Um, so that you know it's easier for you to perhaps club and respond to them. May I post okay. the very sure. first yeah. set of questions? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so the very first question that we have is from Anisha TV, and I'm reading out the question. As you mentioned, Professor Saruke, based on Ambedkar's writing, fraternity is the foundational principle for achieving a democratic society. How does one cultivate a sense of fraternity, especially in hierarchical societies like South Asia? How will the individual mental disposition take place to achieve a democratic self that emerges from undemocratic systems of family, religion, classroom, etc., to name a few? The second question, uh, Professor, Faru uh, Professor Saruki, is from Susan. Uh, thank you for the wonderful session. Uh, when one thinks of fraternity, are there not multiple visions of fraternity amongst communities along the lines of caste, language, sex, etc.? How can one therefore think of a shared understanding of fraternity that can then flow into the conceptualization of democracy for the people? Okay, uh, very quickly, um, I think the first question, the um, the answer is how can we do it is that's what the whole book is about so um how can we do it is to look at um, okay i mean i, I don't want to um, you know push you off to telling you to read the book to get the answer uh, very quickly what i uh, what i can say is that uh, you know one of the ways by which 
it, and it's part of always my work in the sense that um, you know I I think that unless we understand with some clarity the conceptual basis of ideas, um, action is not necessarily guaranteed to lead us to the goals that we want. In other words, um, action is very deeply related to our capacity to be able to have certain clarity of range and depth of ideas, right? And therefore, this exploration of these uh, conceptual bases of democracy is to be able to allow us to do that, is to be able to uh, find out ways by which we can be democratic. I've also, in, in this book, I've also tried to be very careful not to be um, preachy or programmatic. Um, you know, I mean, that's a, it's a question I struggle with all my life. I struggle with in every position whether within the family or as a within as a faculty or within institutions what is it to be democratic how am i how am i how are my actions democratic so this comes from for me because it speaks very deeply to my own struggles with uh, individual action right so um, so i'm also not telling uh, the getting out of this quick answer by saying well you have to practice it and see it but i'm all i'm saying is that once we begin looking understanding these conceptual structures of what we mean by these ideas of democracy, it does open up spaces for me to uh, act democratically in very many different uh, domains of my action. That, and I can only say that from uh, experiences, uh, personal experiences and other experience of people who have tried to do it, that these are very useful ways to do it. Again, as I said, that's really what the book is about, trying to show us the pitfalls and without trying to tell people, this is what you should do if you want to be democratic, okay? and I. I I'm a bit sensitive to that question of trying to say that I know what is it to be democratic and this is what I want to do that, right? Um, the second point is also a very important point um, because people have, of course, interpreted Maitri as friendship, translated it as fraternity, friendship, etc. There are different ideas of friendship. And we know that friendship is also a very culturally loaded term. And that's something which is, um, you know, ways in which the ideas of friendship have been formed. Uh, but there is a clue within Ambedkarite idea of uh, fraternity or Maitri the fellow uh, beingness, you know, uh, the you know the fellow being, the, the recognition of a fellow being, and uh, you know while there has been um, some amount of writing on Ambedkar's idea of Maitri and uh, Gopal Guru and uh, in our book on everyday social uh, discusses extensively in the last chapter of the book um, on Maitri as a very fundamental principle of social cohesion. Uh, we uh, the point the point is that uh, we do believe that within uh, Ambedkar's formulation of Maitri, as we, for example, as we discussed in the chapter, there are possibilities for uh, recognizing particular kinds of uh, fraternity relationship within, in the context of Indian society. Okay, and one can extend this uh, in other ways, and I, I don't see this as a global framework for everybody. I'm just saying it as a conceptual way to say, well, given that this is the kind of social or order, this is the kind of we are we are inherited the social organization. How then do we develop this question of fellow being with everybody else, independent of who they are, which can inform the actions that we do? So um, I do think there is, um, within that idea of uh, fraternity, there is enough that we can do in response to the Indian society. As I said, that's where something which is can also be very specific to the way um, to, I can put it qualified and limited it. But I do believe that this kind of approach is, of course, very important. And I see particularly the questions of racism and other stuff happening in societies around us, I do see how one can reorient oneself through this production of the democratic self in these particular ways. Um, so I do think there is some possibilities. Um, but yeah, it's been one of the greatest challenges to be able to say, um, you know, what do I do with fraternity? How do I operationalize it? And why in a society which can accept political equality to some extent and accept that democracy is about social justice to such a large extent that as scholars point out, why is it that we still think so difficult to find notions of fraternity with people who are not like us? And especially in India, it's increasing now and I'm like, why? I mean, I just don't get it. What is it that is coming in the way of doing that? So how do we then therefore talk about this notion? How do we legitimize some of these moves as part of uh, what we would see as, uh, you know, ways by which society should be understood and operated. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Saruki. Uh, if I could pose the next set of questions. Right. Um, thank you. So the next question is from Navneet Kaur. 
and it reads given the kind of subjectivity that is involved in defining the notion of democracy how can one resolve the tussle between abstraction and objectivity most abstractions around democracy are often misused by vested interests then how can one really reach a definitive understanding of democracy along with this i will pose a question from grace raju and the question reads going back to the significance of lived experience in your book crack mirrors how does the self remain not affected by patriarchal and feudal values and become a pure democratic self hmm. is the the idea of a democratic self then a utopian one or maybe an aspiration okay all you are putting me on the spot all these questions are so difficult but that's a good part of it and i hope you know as i said the whole idea of the book is to trigger criticisms and conversation so you know i'm glad that um so the second part uh, is the democratic self an ideal self uh you know uh, it's difficult okay let me put it this way i don't think it's ideal self so i give an example i think i'm just trying to recollect what i did in the book i give an example of how the state produces selves okay the state produces selves like the reasoning self if you look at education right from our school education what is the function of our education why do we study the subjects that we study why is for example particularly in india science teaching science has got such a high value what is the what is the aim of producing that kind of uh, um, you know training one of the most important reasons for producing the kind of education system that we do right from schools with this emphasis for example on science and mathematics is the belief that education can produce reasoning selves and in in context in, for education is when they define discuss and disagree with questions of goals of education for example when people say well the thinking should be the aim of education making them critically think is the aim of education for example even that is a kind of a formation of a self which can critically reason on its own or whatever it is right and your whole apparatus of society and government are behind it there's nothing natural about education as we have seen especially with uh, you know the new policies and education which every government wants to do schools parents teachers peers government policies everybody functions towards producing selves of citizens to the extent that you know we are producing thousands of children in india in our education system who think that uh, any exposure to social science and humanities is irrelevant because it's a particular kind of a production of a self and we are all complicit in it because you can't say anything about it so if you can produce such reasoning selves as operative selves in a society not as just ideal reasoning selves and it doesn't mean that these selves are all completely reasoning in terms of critical reasoning etc but still there's a whole apparatus producing that why is it not possible to produce a democratic self i mean that's at least that's why i mean uh, i i don't want to give in and say it's completely ideal because you know i really think that there are practices which show that it is not um we know for example the self respect movement has had for example the impact of that so i do think that um, you know this is a possibility which is uh, you know something which we can consider and develop and produce and that is what citizenship really would mean citizenship is not to show uh, you know your belongingness to this or your eating habits or your dress habits or what you say but it's actually about something more about being part of this production of democratic self um hopefully if you read the book you know you may get slightly little more convinced but i i do think that's even if it is a ideal it's something which we need to uh, work towards sorry i missed the first one just remind me very quickly the first and question you had right the first question just i'm pulling it up yes the first question that was that from navneet kaur given the kind of subjectivity that is involved in defining the notion of democracy how can one resolve the tussle between abstraction and objectivity hmm. Yeah. and most abstractions of democracy are often misused by west interest right. and how can one reach a definitive understanding of democracy okay so uh, you know 
with all this I, well i won't go to the extent of saying subjective definitions of democracy although one might tend i mean you have the north korean president saying is democratic and one it might stretch your imagination a little bit but um, remember that in all democracies all function with this trope called the people and it again goes back to a very old question um, in all philosophical traditions which is that um uh, if uh, if there's a slave who is happy being a slave is it really a problem if there's a slave who autonomously wants to be a slave is that a problem would um you know if if a society in which you have an autocratic government but which produces great amount of social harmony and social justice is that prefer not preferable to a democratic government is the another question right so i i in all of this so called subjective ideas or not in subjective i think i would call it as a spread of ideas about democracy still one thing seems to be very clear is about the use of the concept of the people right and even the chinese question when they're talking about democracy and dictatorship as being symbiotic it's still about the the the, the good for the people that comes from this kind of a democratic dictatorship so there is a core idea which is behind it and that's why when i formulate the idea of the ethical imperative of democracy that to me my argument is that democracy is not to be just seen in terms of these kind of definitions democracy is special and of value because it's a fundamental ethical core not just a pragmatic core and the ethical core is not about giving each of us individual freedom and choice but giving all of us the capacity to act on behalf of the worst off or on behalf of those who are less free than us in order to give them that kind of a freedom or to pull the society up to that level of freedom for all so that's a very operational ethical understanding about democracy is and i think any of those kinds of democracies which move towards that gives us an objective measure um of what democracy is thank you professor saroke uh now i have two questions from the same person which i will post together for that reason uh this is two quest these are two questions from dr paromita patnomish and i read what possible what, what what are the possibilities for conceptualizing democratic dispositions beyond instrumental or institutional frameworks as made available if we shift the site for the production of such dispositions from the locus of the daily to the notions of crisis especially since in the light of post covid restructurings of civil society crisis seems to have become a determining condition of the daily self was an unstable formation marked by the loss of even normative democratic rubrics that's the first question i'd to panobish second question is how does this idea of dispositional democracy relate to cosmopolitanism thank you for this very thought provoking talk professor saroke thank you again uh, two more difficult questions uh, one because um, you know i think the first one is quite difficult because i really have to think through that uh, because um, yes i'm i'm what i was trying to do as i said is in trying to have a conversation with the public who seem to have these problems about what democracy is and how to think about democracy uh, i was focusing on the kinds of questions they had and i think this is a question post covid which is going to become an extremely important one um, i do think that go an easy answer to that is to say we go back to conceptualizing how you Uh, think about questions of fraternity and make that as a basis of human action and not make questions of uh, equality and freedom liberty and equality as a basis and that's a easy way out because the first question you ask is how do how is that possible how is this kind of a community action possible but when i also look at various actions in post covid especially the migrant laborers problems i do find that there is a possibility within communities and people where a large number of people actually did it you know people who went out of the way uh, who may have who, uh, lost jobs who had who didn't have the kind of um, you know wealth that they would have had in earlier times maybe even jobs and money were still uh, participative in various ways of engaging with people who were worse off than them were more dispossessed um 
I, I so this does not reduce uh, you know I should be very careful that I this does not reduce uh, democracy to charity because that's not what it is but it is a, a, a it's a production of conditions in society which makes it possible for others to uh, attain and reach the kinds of levels which all of us as more privileged sections of society may have um, and you know at one level and I think this is something which. Um, uh, not just Ambedkar, Ambedkarites would also recognize largely, is that um, many of these notions of democratic cells, some of the elements of the democratic cell, are already present in the laboring classes, are already present in the marginalized classes. So it's not that it's something which uh, one has to be taught. In fact, it, I would think it's the entitled and the privileged who actually have to learn some lessons of what it is to be democratic in terms of these notions of fraternity and sharing and so on. Uh, from classes who are actually much worse off than them, you know. Uh, but yes, so I do um, think, you know, and it's something which I will have to think through a little more about it. Um, the the question about uh, dispersion democracy related cosmopolitanism. Uh, okay, I must say that in in um, that point never struck me. I was never working, although there was a little bit I'd engaged with cosmopolitan with the uh, the group which was working on it uh, in Delhi, but. Um, thank you for raising this because to me, I see cosmopolitanism as a, again, an action of a privileged and of a communities of people who can, who are global, who are think about this. So in my preoccupation in this book, sorry, so in my preoccupation in this book, uh, I didn't, um, that idea didn't come across at all, you know, in the sense I was not even thinking about them, neither in a global context or neither as culturally inhabiting different cultures with the same ease and so on. Uh, it was just more about uh, trying to kind of understand, rethink through some of the basic concepts we thought about democracy, including questions of freedom and the ethical process of democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know we are exceeding time, but if you will allow, I will post sure. two more questions and uh, yeah. yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We have, uh, we have so many questions, but uh, I'll post two more. Thank you so much again. The next question is from Dishani Roy. Fascinating lecture, sir. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask whether the natural world features in your understanding of democracy. What does it mean to have a democratic habitation with the environment around us? In this regard, are categories such as the social or the political or concepts like the of the people enough? Is it possible to imagine a planetary democracy? Okay. Um, well, again, you know, I, I tend to have this habit and that's not a way to um, push people to read my books. But um, this is a point which is very close to our work with uh, Gopal in the book on um, caste and the everyday social, uh, experience caste and everyday social, we make an argument. And I think what you say about the natural is extremely important. We begin by asking the question, what is actually, how is the social really understood? What is the meaning of the word social? That's really our concern. There. What is that concept of the social, right? And very often when you look at the word social, it's often counterbalanced with that of the individual. So you have individuals and the individuals create the social. And for sociology, this kind of uh, thing is operationalized in, in methods like methodological individualism. Um, and, in, and that's because that's the only way we understand group action, for example. If 10 of us act, we reduce it to actions of each one of us. We know how to see maybe somebody is a leader, somebody for whatever it is. We reduce it to the individuals all the time. And in our own attempt to understand it, and we look at so many empirical examples, we make the argument that actually the positioning the social against the individual is incomplete. It's actually not the right way to do it because every idea of the social and the individual already have a conceptualization of the natural. And this is part of a work which we can actually recognize from, um, you know, um, for science and technology studies from history of science, which have looked at the way in which nature itself has been conceptualized. And one of the slogans which I really like saying, because it seems to sound very um, nice, uh, is that, you know, there's nothing natural about nature. So the word natural itself is a particular kind of a formulation which different natural science uh, groups produce in order to understand what nature is. And therefore, 
that uh, every idea of the social is already essentially intrinsically related to the question of the natural i'm saying this because um if we talk about a democratic self either as an individual or a social self the question of the natural is integrally involved in it you can see that very clearly in the case of labor and caste where the question of the natural comes through questions of labor uh, you know as some people who are fit to do certain things you can see this in gender repeatedly in uh, ascribing natural qualities for the capacities of women to do certain things for example in the context of science there are a lot of very interesting discussions on that so this it is impossible for us to escape from this very powerful hidden presence of this thing called the natural in all these formulations um so i have tried to sidestep that entirely in this book but definitely it's part of our larger uh, conceptualizations of the social thank you so much the next and the last question for this evening is from faizan mukwim and i read the question in ambedkar's writing the idea of maitri seems to be dynamic and not only limited to fraternity Aishwarya Kumar for example argues that Ambedkar in his later writings especially the Buddha and his Dhamma returns to the concept of maitri to uh, in 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 to expand the ethical fold of human action where maitri is not only limited to fellow beings but is also a gesture towards all forms of lives including animals how do you see Ambedkar's change in conception of maitri through democracy okay um again an interesting question yes we are aware of uh, ashwari kumar's work and as i said in our um, everyday social book um, which is just published 3 years back we do um we also i mean gopal and me reconceptualize uh, maitri in a different way we extend ambedkar's uh, idea to talk about um, you know the relationship between different socials different socialities in a society different social groups within society and not between individuals so we extend it to you know because many times people then tend to think of it as just friendship or being kind and being good so we want to move uh, we were thinking we were conceptualizing maitri as a basic ontological term and not as a psychological term and that's a Uh, for us it was a very important move so i agree with you that uh, not just with what ambedkar says but an extension of for all of us to think through i mean ambedkar becomes a philosopher not because just of what he said but because all of us take it upon ourselves to take him seriously and work with him and work um, you know build upon it sometimes critique it and whatever you know like you do for other uh, thinkers taking his ideas seriously as a starting point so um, i do think there is um, that space which is available for us as both ashwari kumar has done and we have done in other book um but what you uh, mentioned in the context of democracy is very interesting um i didn't extend this uh, too much in this book as i said I, you know for me it was a constant struggle to not give in to my academic self right so immediately draw upon hundreds of other things and make this argument counter argument for me it was uh, very important to try and see how i uh, get people to read it and disagree with me or agree with me and also to actually um you know point out the kind of uh, rich ideas which are present uh, within thinkers not just the big but variety of thinkers um, who are often you know get away in as one particular kind of uh, thinker so um but to extend what you're saying i would say that you know fellow being a uh, fellow um, fellow beingness or you know uh, that fellow Uh, that idea is um, something which is actually quite obtuse it's it's not very clearly given and that's why you have different theories of friendship for example um, what does it actually mean to say that what does it actually what does it actually entail drawing upon buddha and extension of it is a natural extension as ambedkar does in his later work um, the fact that maitri is not restricted it restricts restricts across forms is actually a very important part of uh, buddhist metaphysics anyway so i'm i'm not entering into any of those discussions in this book um although as even one of the earlier questions uh, asked there is a question of democratic action towards in nature around us that one can think of if it's a democratic self how do i engage in nature around me and that's a very important extension uh, but in this uh, book at least because my concern was about trying to understand 
how to talk to people about this problem of democracy i have uh, very uh, very closely limited it just to individual action and social processes related to what we see as democracy but um, you know the point you raise is very important and that kind of extension is necessary to do for this concept that brings us to the end of our question answer session and uh, before we move into the official vote of thanks i mean i cannot but thank you for really indulging us uh, we took 30 minutes more of your time it's no morning problem. there but you were really kind to us so really thank you so very much and now i request my colleague aparna patak uh, to deliver the official vote of thanks thank you thank you Anna. Good evening, everyone. It has been an intellectual treat to listen to Professor Sundar Sarukar speak, and on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made today's event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Sarukar, who has given us so much to reflect on. His talk was truly enriching, and as a think piece, it will be discussed much beyond this evening. Thank you for uh, thank you Professor Sarukai for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your insights with us. We are indeed grateful to you. As always I would also like to thank our HOD Professor Simi Malhotra. Thank you to Suman, Susan, Zaira, Sanya and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much friends and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you Aparna it's always thank great to so see much. students yeah, have done so much of you know uh, thank you so uh, much professor sir thank you so, so semi thank you <laughs> thank you and you've got a cold i hope you feel better yeah. through the day <laughs> thank you so much thank you so and much. i hope you do if any of you get to read the book do write to me thoughts sure. and continue sure. this public sure. conversation and we hope to have you on campus sometime soon thank so. you we'd love to thank do that so thanks so much Thank you. Bye.